We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine. That's still not Emily. Welcome my dad, Paul, to the podcast. Hi, Catherine. Nice to see you. And nice Hi. to see that uh, that Cap hasn't, uh, you know, brought you down too bad. Well, so you know how it is, obviously. Um, yes, I do. I grew up at the summer camp that he grew up at. I am a third generation camper at this lovely metal box that I am currently sitting in that is not actually our our permanent campsite, but is our temporary location while our camp eventually gets rebuilt, maybe before, you know, the moon explodes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But so anyway, nice we're here to talk about Formula One, not the fact that our family has been involved with this camp for 70 some odd years. That is correct. That is correct. So nice to see you and thank you for having me. Of course, we're happy to have you. Emily is still making her way back to the United States from Argentina. She will be back on the pod uh, next week for whatever we're going to be doing in the uh, break between Silverstone and the next race. But anyway, that's for the future. Right now, let's talk about you, Paul, dad, et cetera, um, and yeah. your experience in Formula One, because obviously you and I have both gotten into it relatively recently, but you still have a lot more of an awareness of Formula One that I have had. Yes, I was uh, a fan of auto racing from the previous century, the late 60s. Uh, my favorite racer of all time has always been Mario Andretti. And uh, watching him win the uh, Indianapolis 500 uh, was uh, a lot of fun. And that cemented uh, young Paul's uh, interest in auto racing. Um, I did get to see on uh, an ABC network called uh, Wide World of Sports that uh, always used to show the uh, uh, international Formula One. Uh, so I became very fond of Jackie Stewart and uh, later on, uh, Emerson Fittipaldi, who was a uh, great racer in Formula One and in Indy as well. Yeah, and Emerson Fittipaldi and sometimes pops up at races. Jackie Stewart is never not at Formula One races, and he's doing a lot of like great philanthropy work related to to motorsport and sports, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Jackie is a wonderful bodyguard for Martin Brundle on his grid walks. That is also very true. Yes, yes. yes. Um, no, and no since... one says no to Jackie at this time. Exactly. Um, and yeah. since you, we have gotten back into, form, or you have gotten back into Formula One when I got into Formula One, who were your teams and drivers? Oh, I would say that my team, I would say it's, it's actually because of the you know, long history that they've had, I would say my team would be Williams. I am hoping that they come back. Um, I always like to you know, root for the underdog. Uh, so Williams would be my team. Um, you know, one of my uh, my favorite drivers right now, uh, I would say Sergio Perez and Daniel Ricciardo. Fair. Uh, two, two drivers that are struggling at the moment, which is not exactly. our favorite thing. Yes, yes. But th that's that's the, the beauty of the Formula One broadcast is that uh, unlike the U.S. where we only really care about the top two or the top three racers, they work through all 20 racers and hopefully in the future more when they add a team or two. Yeah, like right. perhaps Andretti. Possible, quite possible. Yes, well, of course, you and I have talked extensively about how the the turn of events of the FIA president who now says, hmm, maybe you should just buy a current existing Formula One team, Andretti, in order to get onto the grid instead of being an 11th team. Uh, but... There has not been news about that lately, which probably means, you know, Gene is getting ready to sell the house. I, I would say that uh, that is a distinct possibility. And uh, also, I think there are a, a couple of other teams that could be um, in the offing, uh, you know, depending on uh, the right situation and, of course, the right money. But uh, that's not going to uh, happen until the uh, uh, new uh, covenant comes out. Right, right. The new Concord Agreement, which will be out for 26, I believe. Uh, my brain's a little melted from camp, but I think that's when it's, right. when it's going to be. Um, but yeah, and, and we've... The word covenant, so, you know, there you go. 
Exactly. So yeah. anyway, let's move on to some, some news of the week. For Since we have been in this, you know, triple header, um, there hasn't really been a lot of like big news, but there have been a couple of very interesting stories. Um, Mercedes, most, I, I think this is really is kind of interesting is they are parting ways with their leisure wear suppliers of, of many years, Puma and Tommy Hilfiger, which considering like how powerful the bond between Tommy Hilfiger and Mercedes specifically how that's been it's it's kind of a a a little bit of a shock there uh it's actually pretty interesting um you know from a marketing standpoint these you know these things have arcs uh Mm -hmm. but you know hasn't hasn't tommy hilfinger uh been uh associated with uh uh with lewis their driver a lot so so you know since he's since he's moving away to uh ferrari uh, that may be part of the reason why they uh, have made this decision. Oh, yeah. It's it's whether it's overtly because of Lewis or not, it's definitely, you know, they they see that this time is is, is a good opportunity to shift. Um, Mercedes will be bringing Adidas on in 2025. We will still have a Puma and Tommy Hilfiger tie. Um, I probably throughout the next few years, the F1 Academy, because Susie Wolf, who's the managing director and also the wife of Toto Wolf, who is the CEO of the Mercedes team, um, they still have very close relationships to Tommy Hilfiger and Puma. So it's not likely that we're going to see them go away forever, but we will see them going away from the um, Mercedes F1 team. And then this deal is supposed to be in like the multi millions of pounds um, amount um for right. this adidas deal and it will be more than the puma tommy hilfiger deal combined is what i've read i am sure that is that is absolutely true i mean you know in in this day and age you know it's all about the money and the advertising that you get as part of it uh because you know people want to wear uh you know you know they want to wear what uh their favorite team is and that's what uh, yeah exactly what it is yeah, and I mean, I I remember when I was working at Arizona State when they switched over from Nike to Adidas, and then even like any major apparel sponsor change at the college level, all of a sudden you get opened up to like all these new opportunities for uniform designs and uniform options and things like that. So that's really you know going to be huge for both Adidas and Mercedes because, not to say that that Mercedes's leisure wear outfit supplier has been you know boring, but it has been a little standard. It's very typical of the Mercedes brand. Um, and I, and I think that Adidas is a little bit more, you know, appealing to a wider market, but also a little bit more, let's call it rough and tumble a little bit. And that should bring some, some changes to, to Mercedes as a team. It's the first, my first, you know, response would be, it's all about the swag. Mm -hmm. And when you have a conversion, you get a lot of new swag. The other part of this, going to Adidas, which is a German company, and Mercedes, even though they are headquartered in uh, the UK for their F1 team, uh, Mercedes is a German automaker. So that yeah. has a, uh, a very important tie-in that uh, uh, can reap some mutual benefits uh, in the, in the uh, marketing world. Yeah, and and there's also I I don't I can't remember off the top of my head which team, um, Mercedes. I think that it's the German national team that Adidas is no longer making kits for for their for their football slash soccer. If you're an American, um, so this is like the kind of a big German team replacement. And even though, like you said, they are based in the UK, but that's probably just for tax reasons. I wouldn't know anything about that. No, of course not. Um. <laughs> But in other Mercedes adjacent news, um, their former engine chief will be joining Aston Martin as their CEO. So Andy Cowell, who was basically the guy who masterminded the Mercedes era of dominance from 2014 and with that engine that beat the crap out of every other team on the grid until Max came along. Um, he is going to be replacing the outgoing um, Aston Martin CEO, Martin Whitmarsh, on October 1st. Yeah, that's that. This is a, a, a very interesting development. My only question, though, is with Lawrence Stroll as the owner, how much influence is he gonna is uh, uh, Andy gonna really have as CEO? Because I I just I just I don't see Lawrence, and of course I don't know him, but I don't see Lawrence as someone who is going to you know say you do what you what you think is best and and get back to me when you need something. I don't think it works that way. 
No, I, I definitely don't think so, too. Obviously, Lawrence is a very busy man with, you know, a kajillion irons in the fire. But I think it's very much like this is the vision that I want you to give me. And I don't care how you do it, but I want you to produce it. And if you don't, you're out. Because I feel like that's what happened um, with Otmar Safnauer when he was, you know, excused of his duties as the Aston Martin team principal um, before he moved to Alpine. And then Alpine did Alpine things. And now Otmar just takes funny selfies on Instagram. Yeah, well... We miss Otmar on the grid and, uh, you know, the same way we miss Gunther on the grid. So, but, yes. you know, you can't have everything. Where would you put it? Sure, sure. So it, it'll be, it'll be interesting. Um, and it, it really, you know, there have been a lot of questions over the last couple of years of like, does, um, does Lawrence Stroll want to keep continuing his investments into the Formula One team? Because it obviously is very expensive and he did have to, you know, use his his money and his consortium to dig what was Force India out of the gutter pretty much to turn it into what we have now as Aston Martin. And I think this really, you know, it it's showing that for for better or for worse, Lawrence Stroll wants to stick around. And that, of course, means Lance Stroll still has a seat for as long as he wants. For as long as he can drive, he has a seat. Until yes. until he he realizes that there's more lucrative money in the business of affairs of uh, uh, the Lauren the Stroll estate, exactly. Or until he wants to decide to actually become a tennis pro, like those uh, rumors alleged a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. You never know. It could could be. I wish I wish him the best. Yeah. Um, in other news, moving more towards Silverstone in this weekend, we have two, as of, of this morning, it is Wednesday as we record, um, we have two special liveries that will be making their debuts for Silverstone. One I like and one that is a car that exists. Um, and, and that first one is um, the Williams Staff Tribute Livery, um, which is a giant old Union Jack featuring the names of all 1,005 team members as part of their home race celebration. I am all for this livery. It is one of the great liveries that I have seen in a very long time. And Williams, uh, you know, through their family history has always been about their people. And while mm -hmm. a number of the teams, I believe, say that they're about everybody who is part of the, you know, organization, I think that Williams has always walked, talked, walked the talk and has has done you know just tremendous uh, tremendous work and this is a real tribute to the uh, people that have gotten Williams to this point and you know for the future. No, I I, I fully agree. You know, f you know, for all that Williams you know is no longer owned by the Williams family and they are owned by a venture capital group. You know, you still feel that they're you know especially with James Vows, who's their team principal, you still feel that they're a, you know, a, a family run organization that is just a little bit more professionalized at this point. Um, and is, is looking towards, as, as I, as I've said repeatedly on this podcast, looking towards no longer being the Mercedes driver training ground type of right. formula one team and, you know, becoming, you know, coming back to being one of the powers on the grid. And hopefully we will see that, you know, going into this next reg regulation, but I, I do. I, I like the, I like the livery. Um, you know, it's, it's very British. It's cool to, you know, acknowledge because there are so many people that we know of on the team who are these big names, but it's nice to see that they're acknowledging everyone um, on, on their cars. Absolutely. I fully agree. And, you know, and, you know, it, I know that there's a lot of things that, that, you know, these teams talk about with weight and such, but the advertising capability and the, you know, genuine uh, vibe that you can create with a livery, I think it pays dividends way down the line. Right, right, fully. We, and we, we talked about that, Emily and I talked about in our, our liveries um, episode going into this season of like the, the cars that had, you know, more paint on it are the better looking cars on the grid. And, you know, in the last few years, we've really come away from having cars that you can actually know what team they are on the grid. And it's not just a bunch of carbon fiber Alpine um, with both their awful liveries. So it's, it's really, it's really nice to see that they've kind of are freaking out less about that. You know, obviously the Williams car has had some weight issues throughout the season so far, um, but they're not letting that get in the way of, you know, coming up with a really cool livery for their home race. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, Steak has not been a 
uh, competitor in Formula One this season, but you yeah. always know where they are on the track. Exactly. Yeah, you know, say, say what you will about that green car, but you know that it is a green car. You got it. Yeah. And speaking of, of the other livery, which is a livery on a car that exists, um, Red Bull has uh, announced as of this morning their fan design livery for Silverstone, which is the same, except there's some red paint splatter on the carbon fiber. So that makes it different? Question mark? Um, I Would I call this a, uh, you know, an, a, an updated livery or a different livery? No. no. Thanks for thanks for putting paint on it. I mean, you know, it 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 is as if they, you know, when they spray that yellow paint when they're in in FP one or FP two and they're testing, that's what this is. Yeah, and I mean, it's I, I looked at, so when I first saw the the imaging this morning, I had not put my contacts in, and I'm like, am I just missing something because I can't see without my contacts? Um, but then I, I, I took, you know, I, I finally found some like closer, you know, photos and it'll look cool up close. Like if you're up close to that car, it's kind of funky. But if you're watching it on TV from the United States, then you're probably just going to see a slightly blurrier red blur as Max trundles down the track. And, you know, yeah. that that's that's really what we're going to get, which is which is fine. It's still the Red Bull. You still know it's the Red Bull. It's just I'm not as wowed as they're kind of trying to portray it to be. Right. No, no, no. I I, I agree with you. It's um, it's a thing, but you know, yeah. it's you know, um, but you know, so far with the Silverstone liveries, I would say Williams wins the day. Oh, fully, fully. It'll it'll be really cool to see see that car out on track, and you know, even just to see all of the other you know home race shenanigans and celebrations we're gonna get to get out of like McLaren and Mercedes and Aston Martin, um, and you know, specifically for Lewis and Lando and George, who are the British drivers right. on the grid, um, and maybe it Oscar if he gets adopted by one of those three families, because you never know. So never we know. could have four British drivers on the grid. Um, That's cool. But anyway, speaking of the British Grand Prix, let's take a look back at last year's British Grand Prix, less so because of what happened. Um, well, I mean a little bit because we did have, I wouldn't say a Max vs. Lando battle, but we did have some exciting Max vs. Lando elements um, at the beginning of the race that, you know, could foreshadow what we're going to see this weekend, especially considering what happened last weekend in Austria. Yes, um, I think, you know, there is a... Uh, the dominance that Max had shown in 2023 was clearly uh, prevalent. And, uh, you know, Lando did his best at the start mm -hmm. to get a jump on Max because I don't think Max had the best of starts uh, for, for the British Grand Prix last year. But once Max got going, it was, you know, see you later, bye. And yeah, it, exactly. And I remember, so I was, I was at camp last summer, um, not by the beach. I was on the mountain and I, we were waiting for the bus. Cause I was taking the, you know, the kids on, on a hike and we were waiting for the bus, which was late. So I'm standing, running around, trying to figure out where the bus is watching the race on my iPad, freaking out because Lando took, um, took over the lead from Max for those four laps. And everyone's like, what's going on, Catherine? I'm like, trust me, this is exciting. Um, so that was um, like, I'll, I'll never forget that. And then that was like weeks before we actually started recording podcast episodes for the Going Off Track podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And it was also the first race that Brad Pitt's F1 movie started filming at the live races. Yes. And, you know, hopefully they got a lot of good uh, footage in, especially since I think about three weeks later, they were all on strike. Um, um it, something yeah something like that yeah it was it was right before the strike when that was you know when we have that the iconic imagery of Brad Pitt the co-star whose name I, I cannot remember for the life of me and then Carlos signs in the background in his Ferrari kit um and yeah. we said with um in in a couple of weeks ago when they announced the um the release date are are they going to like photoshop um Carlos's um race suit into whatever team he is going to be in as they get to um the the release date next summer um because if not it's gonna you know be a little bit like oh that's when he was in Ferrari but that's not a thing anymore well I mean they could also you know turn him into a fictional character within the uh within the script and you know he is Carlos Carlos you know playing someone 
Yeah, we'll we'll see what they what they end up doing with with that and with that footage and with what whatever they ended up actually filming that that weekend and what they've managed to film so far because they have, you know, as filming finally resumed, they've continued filming. I you know they were still filming as of um, a few months ago, so hopefully they're you know getting close to post production and hopefully we can get to see a trailer soon because um, I really want to see what this movie's going to look like. It should be a lot of fun. I mean, I'm a big fan of the, uh, you know, the 60s James Gardner Grand Prix and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Le Mans and some of the great movies in the 1960s that, that highlighted Formula One racing uh, with Steve McQueen, Le Mans. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if we can get back to some of that, um, you know, uh, I mean, even, you know, I would even say that uh, Days of Thunder, you know, with uh, Tom Cruise was a, a great, you know, for NASCAR, it was a, a, a fun film with a little bit of plot, lots of racing. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we can get back to that, I think that could be a, a boon for the sport. Yeah, fully. And I I think, you know, obviously Lewis is one of the producers and, you know, with the close ties that the film has to Mercedes, you know, we're going to get as close to to accurate as is, you know, cinematically possible, which is great. You know, the the car that they've built is an F2 car um, that they've used in the movie. So it's not the F1 car, but it's an F2 car that looks like an F1 car. Um, So it'll be really interesting to see what they're going to be able to, you know, use their, their movie magic yeah. on and, and you know make look pretty cool yeah and isn't there isn't there a rumor out there uh speaking of lewis that he's uh looking to purchase a uh a, a gp uh, uh yeah a GP. yeah he 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 might add um you know moto gp franchise owner um along with you know partial owner of a football team uh american football team and you know uh, along with you know non-alcoholic tequila gr- um brewer and all of all of these things lewis is keeping himself busy and planning for retirement at some absolutely. point absolutely eventually i mean he has to get okay. through his time at ferrari first which will be coming up next season exactly exactly yeah right. Um, And then coming up this weekend, I did a little bit of digging into the weather forecast, and it looks like it's going to be um, high chances of rain um, throughout most of this weekend, which will, of course, add a very interesting wrinkle to what is already going to be an interesting race based off of, you know, what we already experienced between Max and Lando um, in Austria last week. And with that chance of rain, especially during Quali, you have the opportunity for the most unusual uh, grid setups. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is, this, this would be a typical, you know, it's, it's a typical British summer. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and fortunately, and, and we'll talk about the, the rookie FP1 appearances in a second. Um, but fortunately the, the rain, the chance of rain for, for Friday is predominantly in the afternoon. So for FP2, um, which means that the, the four, one, two, three, for the four drivers, we're going to see an FP1, um, who are rookies, they'll have a chance to hopefully test out these cars and get experience in an F1 car in drier conditions, um, which, you know, I have talked about pretty extensively about how we're not really convinced that F2 is doing enough to prepare rookie drivers for F1. Um, so the best opportunity that they can to, to race in dry conditions, the better. Absolutely. Um, and, and there is, I think, a significant question, which is being uh, bandied about that, you know, are the programs that are below F1 uh, going to, you know, are actually developing drivers, you know? Well, I, I think the, the answer is yes and no. I think that if you are a driver who's lucky enough to be in, you know, one of the junior academies for these F1 teams, then you're obviously going to be getting a little bit more than, um, what you're getting if you are not an academy driver. Like if you look at the the top standings in F2 right now, um, some of them are are academy drivers, but they're not academy drivers for the top teams, but they're also, you know, not drivers who are in contention for F1 seats next year, like the likes of Kimi Antonelli and Ollie Behrman. And Ollie Behrman is going to be one of the rookies who is going to be on uh, the grid in FP1 for his third appearance so far this season, not including when he substituted for Carlos Sainz in Saudi Arabia. He'll be driving with um, Haas for Nico Hulkenberg. Yeah. 
and and Ollie has done a you know did a terrific job when he was in the seat. So uh, he has shown tremendous promise. Uh, Kimi Antonelli, who was able to skirt the Max Verstappen rule, uh, and you know is is going to be on the grid next year. Probably. Um, you know, most most likely, I said, you know, probably be on the grid. You know, they have been, uh, you know, they have shown their ability to drive an F1 car very well, uh, especially in Sims. But, you know, in the F2 standings, they're doing okay? Not, Question mark? I would say Ant- Antonelli is, is, is kind of doing okay. Um, Ollie Behrman really you know, comparatively isn't. He did win the sprint feature race in Austria last week, um, but I don't think he, he was, he was in the, the feature race. Um, And obviously he's busy doing other things as he is, you know, uh, one of the reserve drivers for Ferrari and Haas. Um, But, you know, it's, it's still, you know, brings to, to question, like the, the best rookie class that we've had come out of F2 was that 2019 rookie class with George Russell, Alex Albon, and Lando Norris. Um, and sure. I think that they're kind of in that closer to savant category like Max Verstappen is than they are just, you know, really being dominant F2 racers. Yeah. And I, you know, this is also, uh, you know, with uh, FP1 uh, having all of these, uh, you know, rookie drivers in, you know, with uh, uh, Williams putting uh, Franco Colapinto. Uh, into Logan's car. Um, I hope Logan is has got a uh, you know a good plan for uh, other opportunities in other uh, racing platforms. Yeah, yeah. He he says that he is looking both in and outside of Formula One for all, to consider all of his options. I think his options are going to be saying goodbye to the F1 grid. Um, but yeah, Colapinto, he's not in you know any real contention for the second Williams seat. I, I really don't think. Um, even though he is fifth in the F2 standings and finished fourth in F3 in 2023. Um, but you know it, it's it's a good opportunity for him, and then we also have Isaac Hajar um, from the Red Bull family, who is in his second season in F two, and he's currently in P two in the standings um, with two wins and two more podiums alongside that. He'll be in for Perez, um, which you know he could conceivably, if things you know eventually open up at Red Bull, he could end up in you know a V carb seat, you know, in within the next few years if he wants to stick around that long. Yeah, it's entirely possible, but, uh, you know, and and I always like the idea of, you know, you want to prepare whatever you're doing, whatever your organization is for the next generation. Right. And, you know, I mean, you know, we all love, we all love Fernando Alonso, you know, uh, we all love Valtteri Bottas, but they're not always going to be uh, on the grid, you know, really is, uh, you know, you know, they're, you know, they're going to essentially age out like most professional uh, athletes do. Yeah, he, you know, he's not going to stick around forever. He seems, you know, positive about the idea that he's going to find um, another seat on the grid next year, whether that's staying with Steak, Sauber, eventually Audi, or somewhere else. Obviously, we have an opening at Alpine. Um, we, ha- you know, he was a you know, a couple months ago tied to a potential seat at Will- at Williams, which would be a return to Williams, um, that considering, you know, Williams is allegedly closing the door on negotiating with Carlos Sainz, um, you know, and Carlos is looking to Alpine, he's looking into Sauber. There's a lot of questions and there's a lot of, you know, options and there's a lot of hurry up and wait for Carlos to make his decision so everyone else can. Exactly. Um, but, and then the other quote unquote rookie appearance. And I, you know, he's, he's not a rookie to the same extent that Behrman, Hadjar and Colapinto are, but Jack Doohan, who is the reserve driver at Alpine, he's going to be in the car again, this time for Gasly. Um, And I, I personally think that outside of Carlos, he's the best contender for Esteban Ocon's seat. You know, obviously they also have Mick Schumacher who is, you know, their, their endurance driver. And he's also the reserve driver at Mercedes, but I, I really, don't think that they're actually looking very seriously at, at Mick, even though, you know, we'd love to see a Schumacher on the grid again, um, as long as it's not Ralph. Um, but mm-hmm. I think that if, if, if Alpine can't get signs, I think they'll go with doing. Yeah. And, and some of the, some of the uh, information that I've seen is, you know, 
Carlos is stringing this along or Carlos's people are stringing this along mm -hmm. and, you know, there should, there should have been, you know, a decision by now. I mean, Lewis set a precedence by mm -hmm. early on saying, Hey, I'm going to Ferrari. And, you know, if, if this doesn't happen by silly season, um, Carlos has, uh, you know, has, is, I think is going to possibly, uh, be without a seat. I, and, and, you know, Emily shares that same concern. I, I share it a little bit less. I think that the real concern is that he might be without a good seat. Um, and we don't really know what a good seat's going to be because if he does take the Sauber deal and Sauber obviously becomes Audi, which he has a ton of ties to, especially considering, um, the boss at what will become Audi was his team principal at McLaren when Carlos was, was driving at McLaren, but the, the real Quite, like, like you said, Lewis sent a, a set a really annoying precedence um, yeah. by announcing on the first of February that he was going yeah. to be leaving Mercedes in a year, um, and it's just you know th screwed everything up for everyone else and ru ruined the party, so to speak. But really, I think that you know he should announce it soon. I don't. I I, I think we're going to get an Ollie Behrman to Haas announcement this weekend. As you are listening to this, as this episode comes out on Thursday, it might already be announced and we'll talk about it in the reaction if it does happen this weekend. But I think that's going to be the more likely announcement we're going to see at Silverstone than, um, than Carlos figuring out what he's going to do. And Carlos might wait until the actual summer break to make that announcement. And then we're going to get, you know, really quickly, we're going to get the announcements from everywhere else on the grid. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, the dominoes will fall very quickly. And I would say that by the end of silly season, we will actually know where the grid is going to be for 2025. Exactly. And then to, to, you know, further add to that, we have, after Silverstone, we have two more races. We have Hungary on July 21st and then Spa on July 28th. And then we go into the summer break. So I, I think I don't want to see Carlos string it out to the end of this month, but it wouldn't surprise me if he does. And like the first thing that gets announced during summer break is Carlos is going to insert team name here. Yeah, exactly. No, I agree with you. Yeah. So for other things that we are going to predict, let us go into our predictions for the British Grand Prix. As you know, um, Emily and I are, um, we have, have points to our predictions and um, we get three points for picking P10 correctly, five points for correctly picking your entire podium and one point for pr uh, picking pole position. Um, and of course, as our guest, you are also going to join in the fun, but your, point, your uh, predictions will not score points. Um, so let us yes. start with um who is your prediction for pole position uh before we do that okay um what's what what is the tally to date between um, you and I, Emily? that's a great question i'm pretty sure it's 21 to 14 uh, because we both picked up points last week in Austria for correctly picking the Grand Prix pole position um, because we thought that Lando was going to take sprint pole and Max got both because of course he did so you're up by a touchdown. Very good. Yes. So, all yeah. right. For poll, I'm going to stick with Max on the revenge tour. Yes. I, what did I pick? I also, where to go? I also went with Max, um, especially because I am pretty sure, quali you know, obviously the weather forecast between now and, um, you know, Saturday can be wildly different, but I think that considering the, the weather forecast looks like it's going to be relatively dry, I'm going with a max pole position as well. And then Emily is going against us. She is picking Lando. I like it. Yeah, right. so we, we will see um, if it's Roberts versus Emily, um, and uh, we, will, we will know that uh, on Saturday. I got it. Okay. Yeah. So what is your prediction for podium at the British Grand Prix? Podium. Podium. Uh, I'm leaning more towards, uh, I think, Emily at the moment. I'm going to go Lando, Max, and George Russell. Okay. Which I think is those, I think those are going to be the contenders for this weekend. I, you know, Mercedes 
took advantage in in my opinion of, of Lando and Max, you know, and their their little squabble, which they're still arguing about. And honestly at this point, I don't care. Um, but I I do yes. think that we're gonna see a, a pretty solid fight between the three of them. Um I went with uh Max Oscar and then Lando. Ah. Um, purely because I think that if it rains on Sunday, I think um Lando might have a little bit of a wet weather moment. Uh, not too dissimilar of what happened in Russia 2021. Um, so I think right. that that is going to give Oscar an opportunity to capitalize as he has been doing because Oscar did come away from last weekend with a pair of P2s. Now, if, if, if Oscar, you know, does get, uh, you know, onto the podium, does that mean, and if he's adopted, does that mean that you have two British drivers on the, uh, on the podium? That depends on what the Norris family decides to do. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, Emily's podium is the same as yours. And she says in quotes, gag me after the the Russell pick, because you know that she does not love picking George Russell. So he loves George so much. George is definitely her by far favorite driver. Um, But yeah, both, uh, both of you have picked Lando, Max and George for your podiums. So we shall see. And for the record, I have not spoken to Emily, nor do I know where Emily is. It's, you know, she is with Carmen Sandiego, as far as I can see. Exactly. So moving on to P10, the last point scoring position on the grid. What um, is your pick for P10? I believe that uh, Daniel Ricciardo will continue into the points and get another point uh, for... uh, for him and uh, his team. So uh, I picked uh, Daniel Ricardo. Okay. I picked his teammate. I picked Yuki mostly because I'm not really allowed to pick Danny anymore because every time I pick Danny, he tends to race really, really badly. So hopefully you picking him will not jinx him the same way that I do. Apparently. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that would, that would be nice. So Yeah. And then Emily's pick was Fernando. Um, so hopefully that means that Aston Martin is on an improvement because they have been struggling a little bit and we would really rather not see that continue because you like Aston Martin as a car brand. I like yes. Aston Martin as a Fernando Alonso fan um, and the hilarity of everything related to the strolls. So I would really like to see Aston Martin improving from where they are right now. I will take that. As a matter of fact, that leads us to our our next category, biggest surprise. And my big surprise is Fernando Alonso is back in the points. Okay. So so you're thinking higher than P10 since you picked Ricardo for P10. I mean, exactly. that would be nice. Um, yes. My biggest surprise is that we are going to have another double points finish for the Haas team. Ooh. And I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, but I, I do feel like Haas has been a little bit, you know, more consistent lately. Um, you know, obviously they do really well on short tracks because short tracks are beneficial for a car who forgets how to drive when you have like those longer straights. So, you know, Silverstone's a little bit more of a, of a midpoint between Austria and, you know, some of the other really long tracks like Spa, but hopefully we can see some continued improvement from Haas because, you know, America, yeah. So so hopefully that that means that we'll see, you know, K Mags and Hulk both continuing to to do well. Obviously, uh K Mags has a lot to prove because I don't think his seat at Haas is as secure as he would hope it to be um going into next season. You know, there's those rumors that Akon, you know, that it could be a Bearman and Akon lineup. Um yep. so you know, Magnuson has to, you know, A play the team game, B drive well and C not get those two um, additional points to his license to get that race fan yes and and with you know with regard to uh, esteban you know he is he has demonstrated himself as a very very good driver um he has not necessarily demonstrated himself at least you know publicly on the grid as a team player not necessarily and you know and not in in any teammate pairing he's ever had but you know still still a capable driver when he's not driving you know a, an alpine turtle that is true that is very yeah. true so. so going into our, our last predictions for the weekend, who is your pick for who is going to do a dumb this weekend in Silverstone? Well, um, I, I hate to be a bit of a broken record, but Ferrari is going to get Leclerc set up wrong again. again. 
Yeah. I mean, I also picked Ferrari. I think that, you know, Ferrari has been struggling very badly pretty much since Leclerc won at Monaco. Um, Obviously, Carlos was on the podium last race, but it was also, you know, Carlos took advantage of the fact that Lando and Max took each other out. Um, And I I really don't think that that should be discounted um, because, you know, love Carlos, obviously, but Ferrari just hasn't been getting it right lately. And I don't know if that's going to change for them going into this weekend. And I think that they might need that week break in between races to figure out what the heck is going on with their changes. And, and yeah, you have to wonder, you know, um, Yes, you know, Lewis is focused on winning with Mercedes right now, but if he kind looks of. at what's going on with Ferrari, where they're, you know, you've got your drivers who are, who are you know, being engineers and, and race coordinators all at the same time that they're trying to drive their car, you got to wonder, you know, how that's going to play out, you know, when you join them next season. Well, I mean, I... I... Uh, for the millionth time, something I've said before is, is Ferrari is at this point kind of where good careers go to die. Um, and, and they're, you know, obviously Ferrari is such an iconic team, such an iconic brand. But when you really think about, you know, recent top tier drivers who have gone to Ferrari and struggled, Fernando Alonso is one of them. Sebastian Vettel is another. Kimi Raikkonen is another. Um, it, it's it's really a, you know, a place you go before you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right at the moment, I believe you are correct. Yeah. Yep. I mean, obviously we'd love to see Ferrari, you know, re- regain the, the Schumacher era glory, but... I don't see that happening right now. Maybe, maybe things will be different in the next regulation. Um, but I just continue to, to put Ferrari on my dumb list. Yeah, I can't, I can't blame you. And we didn't talk about this. So I have had no discussion with Catherine about, uh, uh my decision on who's going to do a dumb. Of course. Um, they, they are, they are as blind as always. So we will yeah. see who is right with our predictions as we go on throughout the weekend. You can follow all of our updates on going dot off dot track on Instagram. Also subscribe on YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what are your final thoughts for uh, the British Grand Prix? I would like to see a British Grand Prix that has a lot of excitement. Uh, some, some uh, better overtakes than in the past. And uh, if weather plays a part in that, so much the better. Yeah, I agree. I think that we have every opportunity, especially with the way the weather forecast is, it's supposed to rain the most on Sunday during the race, um, which will always add, you know, a level of chaos that we we love to see um, and could have another one of those moments of Haas gambling on the extreme wets while everyone is on inters. And then you see, you know, Kevin Magnuson in the podium positions. Um, so I, I really, I think that that we could be in, in store. I, I know we're going to be in, in store for, for an exciting race purely because of the, the current, you know, touchiness between Max Verstappen and Lando Norris. Um, But I I also just think that it's, you know, Silverstone always provides us with good racing and it'll be exciting to see uh, what we get out of this weekend. Looking forward to it at an early hour. Yes, I will be up very early to watch the race. And then um, some of the campers have been clamoring for uh, permission to watch the replay of the race at Free Choice Sunday afternoon. So I might also be um, doing a, hey, anybody want to watch race in 30 of the the British Grand Prix? Find me where in, in the video room, probably. Um, so that is, a, is something. A, that a Formula One who? I love it. Yeah, we actually have a, a good number of Formula One fans that are campers and a number of the staff so we shall see what that ends up looking like um the the campers are certainly tenacious and really want to uh to watch that so um that is probably going to be my sunday afternoon plans um but anyway that's that's what we got for our british grand prix predictions episode uh our british grand prix reaction episode will be out on monday as usual and then following that um TBD on what episode we are going to put out um, in the break between Silverstone and Hungary, but we'll see. Um, And uh, thanks for going off track with us.